you've transcended a liminal threshold into history fuzz, a realm of contemplative inquiry in which leading researchers demonstrate the motivations, tools and skills of the skywatcher surveyors, architects and builders who delineated monumental landscapes with awe-inspiring structures enshrining their diverse cosmic chronicles in stone. I'm your host, Ashley Cowie, and you can unlock exclusive videos, maps, articles and early ad-free access to new episodes by becoming a member on HistoryFuzz.com. Brian Bauer is a full professor in the Department of Anthropology in the University of Illinois at Chicago, who applies archaeological and ethno-historical theory and method in his investigations of prehistoric indigenous territories in South America. In this episode, Brian recalls his field surveys and excavations in Peru, detailing a highly revered solstice alignment framed by two pillars at the Island of the Sun on Lake Titicaca. And he deconstructs Cuzco's controversial Seki network of shrines and alignments, which he explored and charted based on fragmented Spanish accounts. Join me investigating Inca astronomy, architecture and creation mythology through the highly experienced perspectives of Professor Brian Bauer. What I'd like you to do to open this up is to discuss the findings of your 2001 paper, Ritual and Pilgrimage in the Ancient Andes, the Islands of the Sun and the Moon. And in that answer, give the audience an overview of the roles of the sun, the moon, the stars and the planet within greater Andean cosmovision. Sure. It is well documented in the Spanish Chronicles, which were written soon after the Spanish invaded the Andes, that the Incas and other people of the Andes worshipped the sun and the moon. This is almost a universal feature uh, among all ancient cultures because they are such obvious objects of the day and the night sky. And almost all cultures use the movement of the sun to mark our daily time and the annual time as well. And the documents talk specifically about the Incas watching the December solstice and the June solstice from locations in Cusco, and that they watched the sunrise and the sunset on those days from specific locations, and they held large rituals on those days. So as part of our research on the islands of the sun and the moon, these are located quite a ways from Cusco, and they're located in the middle of Lake Titicaca, actually in what is now Bolivia. And we know that the Incas also held rituals on the islands of and the moon. And so part of our larger project to document the history of these islands, I and an astronomer, David Dearborn, took a series of measurements at various places on the islands. And the most important place, and not surprisingly, was near the northern end of the island of the sun where there is a rock which is well known to have been worshipped by the Incas as where the first sun emerged, rather like our Big Bang. It is there that the sun first arose and their universe was created. So we started our astronomical research there. We also conducted as part of the project a survey of the entire island to find all the archaeological sites there. 
uh, the previous survey had taken place or the previous archaeological work on the island of the sun had taken place almost 100 years before us uh, by Adolf Bandelier. And there had been no, surprisingly, there had been no other research on the island for that century. So we went out to the island, the sun and the moon, as part of a larger project run by myself and uh, Charles Stanish. And as part of that group was David Dearborn, our uh, astronomer, and we took a series of measurements. And the first measurement we took or concentrated on was looking at the sunset from the famous rock of the sun. And as we set up the, uh, our equipment, it jumped out immediately that there were a pair of ruined towers on a ridge, which could be seen from the plaza in front of the rock and that the sun set there on the June solstice. And that took us a few minutes. All we did was set it up, looked up, and my colleague David Dearborn said, well, the sun sets between those two piles of rocks. So that was an immediate discovery, which was was great. Uh, The sun rise cannot be seen, or better said, it cannot be marked Uh, from that same location because the sun rises in the middle of the lake. And so there's no way you can uh, mark that. Yeah. So having found that, we tried other locations that might be of interest to the Incas of watching that uh, very special sunrise. And so we also took measurements from the very entrance of what is Um, a sacred complex, uh, a district on the northern part of the island. (coughs) And we found that from that entrance to that complex, you can see the sunset beneath the same pillars on the horizon. So that was a a surprise to us. And what it means is that people could see that same event who are not from the doorway of the complex. And they would see those, that event occurring as in the same way that people within the plaza next to the sun would see that event. And so you you could see there we have a separation of classes. The elites who could go in and stand near the rock of the sun could watch the sun set between the pillars, but also more commoners who did not have permission or the status to enter into the this compound could also watch it from outside. And our analogy of that is that you could imagine a a large cathedral in Europe, and it might be filled with important people and they could watch the mass occur, but the commoners could also stand outside the church and watch these events occurring. How many degrees on the horizon did those pillars identify? How tight was their boxing of the sun, Brian? And then come back to your overview, please, but I'd love to nuance that. I can't remember the exact meters between them, but the pillar, let's say maybe 12 meters, something like that. The point to the pillars is that they would frame the sun exactly on either side. And that's when you know you have a really good match Mm -hmm. because the sun sets exactly in the middle of those pillars and they frame the sun on the solstice. So in fact, for three days, the sun will rise and set between those pillars because the the movement the day before and the day after the solstice can't really be, be seen by humans. So the sun would be seen as crossing the horizon and then rising and setting for three days 
exactly framed by those two pillars. What happens is that if you are in direct line of those pillars, you would have the elites in front and they could see that event. Mm -hmm. And then if you went in a direct line further back outside the complex, commoners there would see the exact same event. They would see the sun setting between the pillars as well, just like the elites did. Okay, so you're saying they were on the same axis, just further removed. Exactly. Two weeks ago, I interviewed Dr. Charles Stanish, your colleague. Yeah. Charles described it as a football game where you have the front row seats and you have the guys up at the back who are seeing the same event, but just from a less prestigious viewing point. Exactly. Wonderful. So great, Brian. Now I'm going to haul you back to where you were. They were giving us an overview of the island of the sun. You were talking about the mechanics of the pillars and the worship that was going on there. So if you can pick up from there, fine. But if not, I can ask you a question. Um, so what we found is that from the entrance into the compound, people outside could watch the same event as the elites who were in the Plaza of the Sun. Now that makes it very interesting to us because horizon markers are important for large scale ritual. Mm -hmm. You can of course mark the sun by having some kind of gnomon and you watch the shadow or you could have a window and have light casting. But horizon astronomy is very, very different. And this is one thing we, we really highlight in the book. And I think it's one of our biggest kind of take home points is that horizon astronomy is for large scale rituals. Horizon astronomy is in fact a lousy clock mm -hmm. because if you looked at your watch, it, at, it would be the same time for three days. The sun's movement is not significant on the horizon for three days. So in fact, that's a lousy clock. You could see movement with light casting or shadow casting. But the point is that humans will accept that inaccuracy because it can be seen by thousands and thousands of people. As many people as you can crowd into a plaza, which is about the same separation as the pillars on the horizon, and then moving in the same axis back. Brian, yes. in other words, but you're perhaps saying the theater and the ritual was more important than it being used as a calendrical device. Absolutely. As I've said, the, the horizon astronomy is not as accurate. If if you're going to keep track of time up to the hours, you can do light and shadow casting. Mm -hmm. But horizon astronomy is a little bit more general. But the point of that is thousands of people can watch it. And in the fact that thousands of pe people can watch it, it then gets built into large scale state ceremonies because the link between, let's say, the sun and the ruling elite becomes concrete and visible to everyone. And there's no denying because there they see the elite, the rise of the sun, and that large scale or that large scale event festival is also sponsored by the state. Yeah. So the state will bring people together. There may be food, there are other pageants tree. But it's all tied together by the state and thus reconfirms the state's role as the keeper of time for people. Brilliant. The keeper of time for people. Now, I've got to reflect back on something else Dr. Stanish said. He describes a pyramid mound in Peru whereby he actually watched students standing on the mound and he watched the hierophany of the sun setting behind them. Now, my question is, at the Island of the Sun, with the public behind the, the rulers, 
Do you think perhaps the sun was seen visually setting between the two pillars, but then conceptually setting into the rulers who were in front of them? Was it actually unifying the sun and the ruler in a visual theater? No, it wasn't exactly that because the sun is coming down at an angle, right? It doesn't come straight down. It comes, it, it's setting across an angle. Sure, okay. So the, the, the ruler would have had to have been standing at a nice angle for it to have worked. <laughs> right. But nevertheless, everybody is watching that event together. And you wouldn't need that kind of, you, you don't need that kind of line and dot connection. It's a spectacular event on the horizon that can be seen by everyone, orchestrated by the state, and that's that's simply enough. So, Brian, I read about your alignment. I'm going to call it your alignment because in a great part it is, and you know for the last two decades, an entire new age cosmology has been built on that alignment, but we'll come back to that later. Mm -hmm. What haunts me and what I've always dreamed of asking is, have you checked to see if there was anybody watching what was happening on the winter solstice sunrise going back on the axis from the other side it's on a ridge so there is no other side we didn't continue that we didn't continue the line and i i i hadn't thought of that i i suppose you could go on the other th other side of the ridge the very far right the very far part of the island and look back but for us the important thing there it, it's more of the metaphor where you're standing you're standing at the origin place of the sun now many people will say in astronomy, well, you can see the sun rise or set on the solstice, but you know, anywhere in the world you can do that. Uh, anywhere in the world you can see the sun rise and sunset. But not anywhere in the world can you turn to your buddy beside you and say, we are standing at the point of creation where Vera Kocha once stood watching this. Absolutely. So the point is, there are a lot of general astronomers or amateur astronomers who will go to an archaeological site and say, well, from this site, I can see the June solstice. Yeah. Okay, any place on Earth, you can see the June solstice. So that's not good enough. What you have to have are probably two things. One, markers on the horizon. And that alignment is critical because that alignment is man-made. And so we know it's not circumstantial. Yeah. And there has to be a logic for the observation point. It should be a plaza, uh, some kind of man-made. Cleared level platforms were popular in the Andes. A place where hundreds, if not thousands of people, could observe this and this is all trying to get away from the fact that you can see the solstices almost anywhere on earth yeah. so watching the solstice is not good enough yeah. uh, for the archaeological confirmation uh, if it's going to be used as an observation point um, it needs those features markers on the horizon and a lot and a public place to watch the horizon and on the island of the sun what better place would it be to watch the sun to worship the sun because you're standing at the origin place of the sun and then you're looking at the the june solstice so there you have shall we say a constellation of events that for us really nails down the importance of the island, the sun, and the June solstice. Yeah, Brian, I'd like to run this past you to get your immediate thoughts on it. I, I actually asked Professor Giulio Magli for his opinion on that, what I'm about to say, and I'll keep what his reaction was until I get yours. If you extend your alignment, the 
the solstice axis from the island of the sun through the two pillars, that terminates on the west coast at Lima, but it terminates precisely on the Temple of the Sun at Pachacamac. Do you think that extended solstice alignment terminating on Pachacamac is a coincidence or not? I think it's a complete coincidence. <laughs> That's what Julio said. There is no way, there's there's simply no way that the Incas would know that. We can do that with Google Maps. We can do that with satellites. But you know, the Incas did not have satellites. The Incas did not. And so once you start extending these things to what to me are absurd distances, they hold no value. And so that's why when you have these studies of archaeoastronomy, you need two things. You need a very skilled astronomer and you need an anthropologist or an archaeologist who will be able to look at those events and say, are these relevant for the culture? And you, that's why we need to work in, in teams because often you have astronomers who are fascinated with the events and the movement of the stars, and they may find various alignments almost anywhere. You can, if you walk around enough, you can find whatever alignment you want. And you might have, and you might have anthropologists who have a very weak understanding of, of astronomy. And so they're playing fast and loose with, well, this sun rises in the direction of the June solstice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and so you need a pair that can um, push and pull one to look in the stars and the other one to pull them back to earth. Right. Brian, can I tell you what Julio said? Sure. I made that simple proposition and he said, Ashley, is that a solstice alignment? And I said, yes. And he went, forget it. No way. And I went, why? And he said, if it was meridional, or following the, la the lateral, I would hear, I would listen to the next part of your story, but there would have been no reason to do it. It didn't play any function. But I think the fact that if you do use Google Map and extend your alignment, the one you've just described, yes. it actually does hit the center of the temple of Pachacamac. And I think it's therefore a beautiful example of how modern interpretations can be misled by digital technologies, isn't it? But both you now and Julio have both shot that down very quick. So thank you for that, Brian. Uh, you're welcome. I think the important thing is to think that modern astronomers look at the sky for science. And for ancient cultures, this was not a science of the sky. It was a calendar. And it helped them generally keep track of the movements and the appearance of a small, relatively small number of events. And it's easy to extrapolate from that. But you also have to think, well, why would you need to go there? Why would you do it? And is there historic information that supports this? Yeah. supposition. Yeah. And that's tough because we have very few documents. None of the documents we have for the Incas are written as astronomical texts. That's different than the Maya. The Maya, there are actually texts that talk about observing the, the Venus especially. But for the Incas, we have, the Incas did not develop a system of writing. So all we have as far as textual evidence is information collected by the Spaniards. And so these are generally very vague references, yeah, yeah. one line, two line. They generally are collected in anti-idolatry movements. Absolutely. And so it's tough. The, the best descriptions come from Polo de Ondegardo, but he wrote in 1584, Five, and we only have a summary of his text. The full text has been lost. Um, and there are people who copied it. And so we have access. But if you look at the references we have for actual astronomical sightings, 
it could all fit on maybe three or four pages. It's not it's not much, and it's usually very general. In Colombia, 1608, Simon Cobo was one of the Spanish missionaries who interviewed the last of the shaman, which was very insightful. But 40 years later, you had Bernabe Cobo. Now, so many Andean archaeologists, anthropologists, archaeoastronomers refer to these works like they are evidence. My question is, who told the Cobos? Where did that come from? Do you know? Sure, sure. It, it's it's very clear. Um, um, Polo de Ondegardo, as I said, wrote a treatise in 1585. And now that treatise is lost. But a summary of that was published okay. in Peru. So almost all the references in Peru use that summary because that was published. Yep. And it was written, as I said, by Polo de, de Onegardo. Mm. However, Barnabé Cobo had the original document, and he says that. In his chronicle, he says, I have this great document uh, from Polo de Onegardo. In fact, I have the document with his own signature on it. Okay, okay. So he's not relying on the summary. He has the actual document, and so he includes longer sections than are included in the summary because he had the actual document. It then becomes lost. So almost all Bernabe Cobo's information comes from Polo, and Polo was a, a master uh, recorder. He, he led a series of investigations in Cusco. He was the Corregidor uh, of Cusco, uh, two times, one in 1560, I think, and another time in 1572. He was appointed by Toledo. So, in his official capacity, he ordered these investigations, and his writings are really the most authoritative. But again, He's collecting information. He sends people out and says, well, tell me about the myths of the Inca. Tell me about the religion of the Inca. So this information is brought in into those contexts. Fabulous. So let's not actually get distracted by Kobo. Let's go back to the main theme that we were on there because what we, we, we were at the Island of the Sun and I wanted to ask you how the, the you talked about the plaza and you talked about the viewing area for the for the lower classes, if you like, than the elite. But where was the Temple of the Sun? How did the Temple of the Sun situate within that landscape? Where was it? There are various structures at the north end of the island. Okay. Um, and there's a large building there, and we don't know if it was a Temple of the Sun or not. In fact, I would argue there's no need for the Temple of the Sun because you have the rock where the sun emerged. And so okay, yeah. That would be in our sense the temple. That is the sacred ground. Yeah, yeah. The rock itself and the plaza in front of that rock uh would be the the temple where offerings were made to the rock and where observations were done. The rock you're talking about as a center of Inca cosmology, a point of creation, if you like, is there any evidence, Brian, of that rock having represented a center for any of the pre-Inca peoples? This was the point of Dr. Stanish's and my investigation okay, yeah. on the island of the sun and the moon. So we knew the island, the sun and the moon were important in Inca times. Uh, that they had facilities there to give offerings, w one on the island of the sun, to the sun, and, of course, to the moon on the island yep, of yep. the moon. So that's well documented by various uh, chroniclers. Our question was, how far back can we push that? When were the first observations of the sun? So the myth 
is that the sun appeared for the first time on that island. So we wanted to trace in many ways the origins of that myth. And that's why Dr. Stanish and I, that's one of the reasons why Dr. Stanish and I worked on the islands of the sun and the moon. We spent two or three seasons there. We did survey to find all the sites, not only the Incas, but all the sites. And then we excavated at critical sites that we had found. And what we found was a really interesting uh, pattern that the islands of the sun and the moon are first occupied long ago. Yes, yes. Thousands of years ago. You have hunters and gatherers out there for the first time at the time that hunters and gatherers were across the Andes. But in our excavations, we find the first substantial cultural material located within that northern complex where the Incas worship the sun. We have Tiwanaku remains. And Tiwanaku was one of the first large states to develop uh, in Bolivia. And it rose, the dates are probably 500 to 1000 AD. And that's where we find the first substantial offerings and material at, in front of the rock, the sacred rock of the sun. Then we have Tiwanaku collapse, and the area is largely abandoned. I'm sure that people continued to go there, but there was no state to maintain a state facility. Sure, yeah. So it remained sacred, but there were no longer state rituals there. Then when the Incas take over the, the island in the Lake Titicaca area, that returns and you have inca offerings at the exact same plaza as tiwanaku so with that we can say not only did the incas worship the sun and the moon there but Tiw it the origins go back at least until tiwanaku times okay and more yeah. interesting for the cultural anthropologist or the archaeologists such as dr stanish and i is that we can trace the importance of ritual control. For example, now, who controls Mecca gains great prestige. Yes. On the islands of the sun and the moon, and we found the same things, uh, a series of Tiwanaku and Inca remains on the island of the sun and the moon. So states are in investing they're building facilities. They're holding rituals on this island in relationship to the sun. When those states collapse, I think there's a folk knowledge. We know there's a folk knowledge because when the Incas come back 400 years later, they perform their rituals on exactly the same spot. So people continue to know it, to know these locations as the origins of of the sun and the moon, but the, there was no state investing in it. So the use of the islands and the islands of the sun and the moon trace the rise and fall of complex societies on the mainland. When they're large states, there's activity on the islands. Why? Because the elite want to be seen as in control of the origin place. When there is no state, that falls to kind of a more local level uh, jurisdiction. Considering the most common creation myths of the Incas, do you think those creation myths generated and evolved in pre-Inca times or do you think they were created by the first dynasties to enhance their rulership? What do you think? I think one could be anywhere in the Andes and see the, the sun yeah. rise and set. So you have to think about it, this it, in a number of different ways. First, why would they pick a remote tip of an island 
to believe that was the origin place. You could have picked anywhere, but it falls into a frame of pilgrimage that you pilgrimages usually take place in remote areas. Mm. So it's a movement of people. You take a pilgrimage to often a remote area and it is there that you you watch this. And, and part of the idea is that remoteness that provides some kind of sacred charge to that location. Of course, there are pilgrimages to Rome or other things, but often pilgrimages are to remote areas where special events have taken place. So that area becomes sacred in some ways because it's it's remote. It's not a mundane location. The word that we use is pilgrimage. So often people think about the destination where the pilgrimage leads to. But if you're traveling from London to Rome or to Jerusalem doing pilgrimage in the medieval, which you can say is loosely when the Incas emerged, it was all about the dangers, the experience, the learning, and the friends that one made on the pilgrimage to the destination. The destination was just a chaotic tourist centre like the modern ones, but it was what you had to endure to get there. But perhaps equally, the stories you brought back and maybe the things you brought back. I think pilgrimage, the movement of people, is, is vital in the idea of a, a sacred place. And again, we have good documents from Kobo talking about thousands of people visited the islands of the sun and the moon, yep. and they came from all parts of the empire. So I would expect, like almost all pilgrimages, if you made that pilgrimage, you would come back and you would have special status within your community because you have gone to essentially the beginning of time or the center of the of the cosmos and you would return the wonderful thing because of the the chronicles we have about the sun and the moon is that we know that there were rest stations state rest stations along the way for pilgrims to stay and transportation from the mainland to the islands was probably controlled. So in many ways, and I think this is true for so many yep, yep. Uh, pilgrimage places, it's not a casual movement. As you get closer and closer to that special place, it's controlled tighter and tighter by the state up until some people were allowed to enter the sanctuary and other people of lower status probably would not be able. And yet they could still see the June solstice if they were there, but they couldn't enter. But all the documents talk about the state controlling the last few days. And so you're going through a state defined landscape. They're telling you where you can sleep, where you can travel, and all that enhances the notion. Think of it as Mecca. The state controls. And when the pilgrim, pilgrims get to Mecca, there are a series of places that they visit, which are associated with, with the, the area. And yet the state controls each of those. And so you leave you would leave the island of the sun not only having visited uh, the the sacred place where the sun first emerged, but filled with the notion that the Incas control this and the Incas are legitimated through their control of these this particularly important point on the landscape. And of course, pilgrimage, if you're saying there was um, accommodation networks and stayover houses, what that whole pilgrimage system does is promotes exchange, doesn't it? 
where you don't have a monetary system, but people trading and exchanging commodities and goods. So it, what it's doing is kind of supplying lifeblood to the function of the empire. Would you agree with that? Or is that too far? I mean, that rings true for what we know for, um, for European pilgrimages, for Christian pilgrimages. I'm not sure on that level how it works for the Incas. Okay. If people would come, maybe they, they would just bring what they need and then the state would provide everything. I don't know if there were large markets uh, associated them. Possibly. Do you think that festival was celebrated in Cusco at the same time as it was celebrated at the Island of the Sun, whereby they coordinated the, sum the winter solstice festival? Is that what happened? I think all across the empire, there were celebrations. We know that there were celebrations on the solstice yeah. all across the empire. Now, if you wanted to go, I would guess, to one of the most spectacular of those, it would be on the Island of the Sun and the Moon. Um, also in Cori Cancha in, in Cusco, the capital of the, of the Inca Empire. But I think everybody, part of the point of the astronomy is the calendar, it marks these days, and the, the state would be sponsoring these throughout the, the empire. That's one thing which is important because People will say, let's say Machu Picchu. Yep. They'll declare Machu Picchu was, uh, uh, from Machu Picchu, you can see some alignment. And so Machu Picchu was, you know, an astronomical observation point. No, it means that the Incas wanted to know specific times. Yeah. And so they looked for them. And... It's different to say a site was an astronomical observatory type of thing from simply saying people observed this event. You could be in Chicago and watch the, the sunset on the solstice, but that doesn't make Chicago an uh, observation, the, the critical role. Totally. And in context of myself, we built a wooden house two years ago and I lined it to the equinox. And sure. I did so because the sun sets behind the mountain perfectly in the West. While that was relevant to me, my son's going to inherit the house and he may know nothing about that. And its original sacredity, if you like, has gone. And what's important is that I would guess... And this is speculating, of course, but I would guess if you went to any major Inca, what are now ruins, yeah. you will probably have a very good chance of finding a solstice alignment because that's important. They wanted to have large scale state observation, uh, state festivals. And because of that, they needed to mark the movement of the of the sun, especially when it involves preparation. If you're going to host a couple thousand people in the plaza, you have to make chicha and bring llamas and food and preparation. So you need a couple weeks to get organized. Do you see the all important 65, 295 degree axis in material culture, in the orientations of pottery? fabrics, etc., or no? I don't. Oh, really? Uh, I am very conservative on this, uh -huh. and I don't know how you would demonstrate that on, on a pot. Th there are some people who look at kipus and say there's one kipu that has 365 uh, knots, but there's always some fiddling around like, well, it's, it's 360. So we think such and such. And so you don't, I was talking with Timothy Pocatat recently sure. and the tablet that was discovered in the Cahokia in America called the Birdman. 
Yeah. And if you flip the Birdman round, which I did with Timothy on the podcast, there was a simple cross hatching of angles. Well, they're 53 degrees, which was the lunar maximum. They chose one angle which matched the lunar maximum, which Timothy's recent work has been based on, the lunar astronomy of Cahokia. So isn't it unusual that you wouldn't find it emblazoned in material culture in the Inca Empire? Or have you not, maybe just not bothered looking hard enough because it's across your New Age line, maybe? That's that's one of it. And I, how do you separate the chances? Um, let's say you, you have a division, a, a simple cross, an X. Yep. And you could say, well, these are 90 degree uh, divisions. And so that's the... East, West, North, South. Cardinality, yeah. Um, and then it all gets into speculation. And for me to be convinced, you would need to have multiple lines of evidence to separate from maybe to, no, this is a, a good a, a good possibility. Yeah, Brian, what you're getting at there is the selection effect. Absolutely. And this is where uh, Tony Avini did a wonderful study on the Nazca lines. I'm interviewing Tony next week. Right. He did. He did a great study of the Nazca lines, because when you think about Nazca, you think about those figures like a hummingbird or a condor. You you think about the, the big figures, but they're in fact thousands of lines and these lines are amazing they go kilometers and kilometers and they're probably not hun- they're probably not thousands they're they're hundreds of yeah. them and you always see the same picture somebody is standing at a line and it's going way out into the distance and you see the sun setting on the solstice there yeah. well that's because they have taken measurements at dozens and dozens of shr- of lines and this one, uh, this one aligns up, and so that's where they they take their their picture. So, just an alignment is not good enough, especially when you are selecting. Yes. Uh, th- there's the the selection bias, right? This is wonderful. You love this. I interviewed Ian Hilton, an English researcher who heard this archaeoastronomical myth, and it's this. For 800 years, Christian chroniclers have written that the churches of England align to where the sun rises on the day of the dedicated saint. So Ian spent 10 years and he went out with his wife and surveyed 3,000 English churches in a square in England. He, He produced all of their orientations and alignments. We discussed how he established those, how he took them, because you get twisted bent chancels. But he showed that Mm -hmm. about 70% of them conformed within five degrees of the equinox east, which shows that the builders, as long as they were aiming east, that conformed with biblical canon. However, if you could read the amount of literature that spun from the idea of aligning to the dedicated saint, because that would be deeply profound, because what else then is associated with it within the landscape? But it's a great example of what you've just described. It really is. We have people here in Moisca, Colombia, who present fabrics. They have red dyes express the setting sun. The yellow dyes express the rising sun. Blue is Venus. And and I'm reading this, I'm going, where does this come from? Now, Brian, I'm going to be really honest because most of this comes from indigenous people telling us oral stories. You can't challenge it the same as if it was you and me throwing stuff at each other, you know, because what is real for us and what's real for them is completely different. I think if you cite your sources, yeah. I mean, if an indigenous person says in our culture, we use yellow for this and blue for that. And, you know, there, there are lots of cultures that have colors strongly associated with directions. Yes. Um, then you, you, you have your source. That's not an issue. But the issue is, do you how far back do you extrapolate and is there evidence that that 
extrapolation is is appropriate. Um, and then you you have to just each person has to weigh whether or not they think the evidence is is sound or not. But I would say you, you need multiple sources, multiple pieces of evidence. Yeah. Brian, can I ask you a question about the Nazca lines, which you brought up? So often I hear it said, and recently on a top astronomy podcast, a researcher said, what's most amazing about the Nazca lines is you can't see them from the land. You can only see them from the sky. And I tend to think someone's been watching too much ancient aliens here because I bet you there's hills and surrounding mountains that you can see them. Have you? Can you answer that? Could you put that into context? The Nazca Plain is immense. Okay. It's huge. Uh, and we only have the lines that are preserved there because that's a, just because of the, the topography, the rains that fall, let's say, once every century or they would be, they wash the chalkboard clean, but there's certain areas that there is no, uh, no water, no rain. And so they have lasted for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and though the hills that surround them are remarkably small. And so while you could climb a hill and see a few of the lines, there are many lines that you would never be able to see because the hills just aren't, aren't high enough and the plain is, is immense. So that's, that's one of the big mysteries. Why do you, make these huge, huge markings that cannot be seen. And perhaps we have to think about, you know, why would they think they could be seen? They have no concept of flight. Uh, we, we, we're looking at that with our tools. Yeah. And so it's, again, taking these ideas out of, the culture, which is why you need anthropologists involved with this, not just astronomers or not people who haven't been thoroughly trained in both. Brian, I spoke with, do you know Dr. Richard Friedman? No, I don't. Dr. Rich Friedman's a leading researcher in the Chaco Canyon. Mm. He generates 3D models, he lidars the ceremonial ways and roads. And the Nazca region sounds to me like an amplified version of the Chaco Canyon. And the question I asked Dr. Rich Friedman is, when you're looking at these drone-generated 3D models of a landscape and you see a matrix of alignments, we can spend a lifetime pulling out relevant archaeoastronomy, but those lines must represent a fragmented jigsaw of centuries and centuries of alignments being built, coming online, going offline, coming online, going offline. And what I asked Rich was this, do you think perhaps the creation of the road itself was perhaps more important than the post-creation functionality had? Do you think it was the labour and the, the process of creating it or not? For a road, I don't know. I see very practical implications that for me, if you can find another example, another justification for building something, I would go for that rather than an astronomical justification. So I'm very, very conservative uh, in that way. I'm using the word road, but... Dr. Robert Weiner and I discussed the term itself, roads and ways, because these were only 12-inch deep ways, and there's no compression in them, so they seem to have been virtually unused. But there are hundreds of them, some of them 40 kilometres straight, and when they get to a cliff face, they don't deviate. There's steps going up the cliff to maintain straightness and a part of our conversation came to this, that while we look for azimuths, and declinations, longitudes and latitudes, perhaps a very important dynamic in the old world we're talking about was just creating something that was straight. Straightness itself being 
the focus. Because if you live in a chaotic outdoor world prone to floods, droughts, ever-changing, something straight must have had the most profound cosmology associated. Wouldn't you agree that the creation of something linear back then would have been profound? I do, and I'll take you on a, a bit of a journey. Go for it. I do, and I'll take you on a, a bit of a journey. Go for it. And I will try to build an argument between three different places in South America that have common features, but they're separated by both time and distance. And yet we see the same phenomena going on. Cool. So let's first start at Nazca, where we were talking about. We know that there were hundreds of straight lines in Nazca. And part of Avini's interesting work is that he not only looked at the lines, but that most of the lines originate from some kind of center. So you'd have a point in the Nazca Plain, and there might be eight lines separating it out. And then you might go over a kilometer, and there would be another center with a bunch more lines going out. So you have this incredible cross-cutting of lines, but most of the lines are, are coming out of a, a, a center, and they're going straight. Yeah. Let's go to Cusco now, and you have what's called the Seque system. And sometimes it's portrayed as like lines coming out from the spokes of a wheel. Uh, that may have been how it was perceived. I've actually went out and mapped uh, the system on the ground. That's one of the nice things about archaeologists. We're very practical. We'll go out and we'll test some of these, uh, these notions. And I have found that they don't come out like like spokes of a wheel, but they radiate out kind of in zigzags irregularly. Nevertheless, we know that people started in Cusco on certain days and walked those lines mm -hmm. and made offerings at certain points, wakas along them. So it's not important if they were straight or not, in this case, what's important is that people are leaving from a center and walking out to each of these points. Now, let's go to my third point, which is an area called Sahama. Very, very high, 4,200 meters on the border of Bolivia, Chile, and Peru. And it's a very, very high area. And plants don't grow well. Sure. It's mostly kind of a low tundra. And there we have clear documentation that up until the 1970s, there were small chapels in this desolate high area. And people would leave those chapels and walk in straight lines to small shrines further out. I want to call it a desert because it feels like that. It's so high and cold. And now those are all abandoned because all the local people there have moved from uh, Catholic, being Catholics mostly to evangelicals. Yep. And so they've abandoned many of the, uh, of the chapels and the shrines. But there's people let's say in the 1960s, 1970s, who remembered walking those lines. And so we have Nazca, we have Cusco, we have Sahama up until the 1950s. And they're each complete, they're very different. Yeah. The physical makeup of each of them is very different. Nevertheless, what they do have in common is movement from a center outwards in straight lines. And so in that way, you can think of it as a pilgrimage or a ritual action that 
people would go out and walk these lines on specific days. And that is the, the ceremony it involved. And so they're very different, but at the heart, each of them shows some kind of deep Andean significance to gathering in a center and radiating out in straight mm. lines. Brian, for everybody that went out on alignments, they would also have returned to the center, perhaps, who they must have. Sure. So it's a dual flow across these wackers, people coming to and people going fro. And I would guess that different kin groups probably walked different lines. Okay, Brian, could you, for the audience, in its simplest terms, describe when the system was proposed, how many lines and how many whackers comprises it, and then we'll get into the functionality. The Seke system is one of the most complex ritual systems known in the ancient Americas. The information about the Seke system is found in Kobo's 1654 Chronicle. But like so much of the important information from Barnabé Kobo, he copied this information from Polo de Ondegardo. And Polo de Ondegardo was in Cusco for many years. And so we know that Polo had one of his documents and he copied this information. Mm. And the information is the following. There are four different chapters in the chronicle of Barnabé Cobo. They match the geopolitical divisions of the Inca Empire. So one of them is titled the shrines or what the Incas called the wakas, the wakas of Ante Suyu, the wakas of Chinchai Suyu, the wakas of Koya Suyu, and the wakas of Kunti Suyu. Those are the four major divisions. And those divisions are based on lines that radiate out from the Kori Kancha in the center of Cusco. Mm -hmm. And Kobo lists, there are in fact 41 of those lines. And so he actually says, from the center of Cusco, the Kori Kancha radiated out 41 lines, or what the Incas called seques, into the countryside. And along those lines were 328 wakas, or shrines. And he then lists them. And so he says, well, on the first line, the first seque, the first shrine is called this. And the Incas offered small pieces of gold or whatever. The second waka on the first seque, this is its name. And it is thought to be a, a, a woman who emerged from the cave of Pakrictambo. Mm. The third waka, and he goes through the 41 lines. So he defines or describes 328 wakas. Yeah, it's a long laundry list. Wow. And you see a human component of that, that the, the first 20 or so of the wakas, he provides lots of information. Yeah. Like this is based on a myth and they give such and such at it. Well, beyond once you get beyond like 20 or 30, He's like, well, this shrine. Oh, why did I start this? Th th this this shrine was called this, and it was a big stone. And the next one is a is a spring called this. And there's a a quick diminishing in the quality of information he he provides, which is a shame. I wonder if perhaps he too got to realize they weren't straight. I don't know, but he there's a. It makes 
the interpretation of the document difficult because you don't have the same quality of descriptions. Yeah. You have very good descriptions for the first three shrines or first several shrines, and then it drops off and you presume that each of the shrines would have had as it would have had an origin myth. It would have had special offerings associated with them. But by, by the end, it's like, this is a spring and it was named this. Yeah. When he listed them, did he go around clockwise? So what I'm asking is, do you have great data on the first 20 oriented to the northeast and then it diminishes? What he does is he goes by Seke and he says the first Seke has five shrines, five wakas. Where was his first one? Did he identify a principal? You know, because he says the first shrine of Chinchai Suyu. So you know that quadrant. Okay. And, and that's all you have. And then he lists them. And in fact, in the list, some of the Suyu, some of the, the quarters, he goes from right to left. Other ones, he goes left to right. And we don't know. We don't know why. Okay. But we do know he'll say the first Seke or line had five wakas. Here are their names. And, and he'll give you five. And then once he's done with five, he'll say, and the second Seke had 12 wakas. And he goes through it. And the third Seke had nine wakas. And he goes through that. Yeah. So he presents the information in a very clear pattern. And I have no doubt that when the information was collected, there was probably a Kipu Kamayo, a, a Kipu reader. Yes, indeed. And the Kipu reader was reading the the Kipu and they had to memorize certain information, but the Kipu probably had, you know, the, the Sekes on it and different knots. And so it was a mnemonic device that they would have and they could tell you, it's like the stations of the cross. Well, you know that they're 12, but each station has a, a different event associated to it. So you could pick her, picture the stations of the cross as one seke, and you'd say the first station is this, and the second station is that. Okay. And so you could use that analogy for how the information would be recorded. Fantastic. Now, I needed to get to this level to ask you this question. While they're not perfectly straight, they're composed of maybe six or nine whack as it slightly differing locations along a conceptual straight line. Do any of those internal zigzag lines cross the next Zeki in line? Do you understand my question? Have I been clear there? Absolutely. Because that's very important because that would define what the thing did, if you like. That's a critical question. And what we did, this was my second major project, is that I came and I said, this is, the Seke system is a huge thing. It's most complex uh, ritual system known in ancient America. Yeah, yeah. Tom Zydema had been studying it for 30 years. Uh, and I came in as an archaeologist and said, you know what? I think I can find a lot of these wakas, even though they had been abandoned for, for hundreds of years. As an archaeologist, we go out and... Brian, did you actually go out on the landscape hands-on looking for these wackers? That was the absolute point of the proposal. I basically wrote, up until now, through the work of Tom Zydema, we have a hypothetical reconstruction that he would show the expansion of the lines across the Cusco uh, heartland, through his reading of the document. Yeah. And I said, we can go out and find these shrines and we can bring ground truthing to the system. And through that ground truthing, we can test many of the assumptions 
that have been laid on top of the Seki system and assumed and built by people. And to me, it was amazing that nobody had had attempted to do this. Uh, And the shame is that we did it in the 1990s. And at that time, Cusco was already beginning to explode with urban growth. Uh, growth. Had this been done in the 1950s, I think we could have found a a huge number of them. But by the 1990s, large areas had been destroyed. People, there was urbanism. And the best locations was when you're out with farmers, far from the city. And the farmer will know a dozen toponyms, place names. Yeah. And so that's where the information is preserved. And we came in at the last moment. And I think in the end, we documented maybe 30% with another 25% with a pretty good guess. What I tried to do in my study is I tried to designate those shrines that we had found, those, those areas that we were pretty convinced the shrine was at, where the waka was at, but we couldn't identify it. Like there might be three, three springs, sure. and we don't know which of those three uh, springs. And there are times when this is our best guess. We don't know, we're guessing, but here's our logic for why we think this place is a waka. And so with that, uh, we went out and, and we interviewed dozens of people. One of the qualifications of my crew is that they would all be fluent Quechua speakers because we could go out and find rocks, but there are a lot of rocks. There are a lot of caves. There's a lot of springs. There are thousands of these things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Only a few of them we're on the Seke system. And so we would go out and interview people. Some of them are well known because they've continued. uh, And we just knew where they, where they were, or the documents would say, uh, this is in the house of this Spaniard. And then we could go through documents and figure out where that house was. And so we knew that the shrine was formally in, in that house. So we spent maybe three, three field seasons in Peru, interviewing people, walking up and down all the valleys, documenting this. And then one thing which is great is that we found they did not overlap. They are separated as they go out. Oh, really? So there wasn't one instance where one zigzagged over another, so they were clearly defined. There are some that may reflect errors in our collection. And so where they do zero crossover, we examine that and say, look, our field data says that they may have crossed, but there could have been two springs called uh, Chokipukyo or, or something. And maybe we have the wrong spring with the right name. So we recognize that in the 500 years, we may not be able, these are common toponyms, most of them. But if you look at the whole pattern, I think they did not, they they probably did not cross and the vast majority didn't. But it is clear that they're a little bit kinky. You were in this, bef- like me, before the internet, before you could just Google something and check it. You had to go to libraries and do the long haul. And I remember being in my late 20s and finding the works of Tom Zaidema. And I've got the actual quote here to put my proposition into context. He said the Seki system was comprised of sight lines to the horizon. And then he supported it with a graphic which showed a wheel with 41 straight sight lines. That was actually exceptionally misleading for me at the time because 
because they are not sight lines to the horizon then. There are perhaps places within a Seki line that one could see something significant on a local horizon. But um, I think what I've got to do since hearing you is forgive him because he did his work prior to you going in and finding out that they were actually fragmented lines, if you like. Is that right? It's absolutely right. And this was our proposition when we went in mm -hmm. that Zeidemann's reconstruction is completely hypothetical. To me, what he did is that he begins with the assumption, and this is something that people will say, well, who cares if they were if they were kinky or if they were straight, it doesn't matter. But if you look at how Tom Zeidema builds his model, it's critical, it's the foundation. He goes in and he defines the course of the seques by events on the horizon, and then claims that all the shrines, let's say this seque had eight shrines, yep and they ended on this horizon, he then walks or talks about the location of wakas in a straight line leading to that horizon. That's wrong. It's completely the opposite. <laughs> I believe so. And that was, we were testing, ground testing Zydema's model. He begins with the sight lines and looks for walk us along that sight line to define the course. I said, I see the landscape as animated. Yeah. There are hundreds of special springs, special caves, special views. Look across the valley and it's an animated landscape. And let's start with the location of the shrines. Mm -hmm. Let's find the shrines on the landscape, and then we will connect them by lines, and that defines the seke. So Tom starts with straight lines to define the waka locations. I start with the waka locations to define the sekes. That's the two fundamental differences. You're sounding exceptionally respectful here, Brian, because surely in the context of archaeology, one is right and one is wrong. There have been people who say, oh, well, Bauer's too literal. We never said they were really straight lines. Uh, they were metaphoric straight lines. And there's all this backpedaling. Yeah. And as that quote you started with, the model says these are straight lines and they're fixed on places of the horizon. We found zero evidence of that. Zero evidence. Not only does he then links this with horizon astronomy, he then links it with the calendar. Yeah. And the seke becomes this incredibly complex time space machine through which the Inca calendar and rituals and everything else. But once you pull those straight lines out of it, to me, it collapses. Yeah, it does. Brian, what you do is you demystify the whole system by pulling the small lines out of the big, because he creates questions and cosmic ponderances, whereas yours is about people and their hands and their feet. And that that model is still widely accepted, but it was a model that was built on a hypothetical. And now people will retract and say, well, it's hypothetical and, and this and this. And as one of my previous guests said, rulers and their command of power were explicit in everything they did. You could see it. And let, let us not diminish the accuracy of the ancient astronomers. Sure. That it's not good enough to say, well, this is kind of in the direction. This is sort of aligns, it faces. No, you want your expectations to match and respect these ancient astronomers and being able 
to make these calls exactly. There's no reason to say this kind of, or this looks like, or falls within a few degrees. Yeah. No, these were skilled people. If they're making alignments, they're going to be right on. I haven't yet thought it through since you've just given me your proposal, but which came first, the wackas or the lines? Let's have a think about that. I, I have no doubt. Go. Cool. The wackas come first. You begin with an animated landscape. You begin with hundreds of special places in the landscape. Yeah. And then you s perhaps want to create some kind of order in that. I believe eventually, and we've tried to, but that land documents are difficult. Copa's original document says that different kin groups were associated with each line uh, each decade, and they would walk along that. Again, think of Sahama as different kin groups would walk along those lines. And I think many of the wakas are land boundaries. And as people marched out following their seke, they're making offerings at their land boundaries. Yeah. And so it's about kinship and it's about land tenure. Yeah. And as you go out, you're marking, I'm making an offering to this shrine. This is my shrine and my lands are on one side and maybe your lands are on another. And we have found many of the walkers listed in land documents on the divisions of different groups, land, uh, land divisions. But, you know, there's only a few really, really good descriptions of small parts of the Cusco Valley. And where we have those, we frequently can identify some of the, the walkers. But to really solidify the, the science, you would need to know more about all the different land divisions in the Cusco Valley. And that's that's pretty hard because as soon as the Spanish came, of course, they divided up the, the lands a little bit differently. Brian, I've got to ask you about a particular wacka before I forget. I've been there. I went there and I would say, I hate to say this, but it's the truth. It was one of the most miserable places I've ever been. I was at White Rock in Vilcabamba. Mm, sure. You've been there, haven't you? You researched there. Yeah, we, we excavated at that. A completely different project, but we excavated at uh, Yurak Rumi. Um, Is that on a Seki line or not? No. It's not. I always wondered. That is, is far, far out. That was a fabulous shrine. Yeah. And in fact, it was burnt. Um, it was diabolic, wasn't it? Yeah, 1570, uh, it was burnt by Augustinian priests. And we have a description of that um, and very, very good documents. It's critical in the whole Hiram Bingham, where is Vilcabamba, is Machu Picchu Vilcabamba debate. But none of the Wakas really go outside the the Cusco horizon. Okay. They're almost all within, I think they're almost all, they're one or two, which are a little bit long, but most of them end on the horizon yeah. of Cusco. So if you stand in the valley, the city of Cusco is at the north end of the valley. So the seques to the north are some of the shortest because the horizon is pretty close. And the seques to the south, it's actually the southeast, are longer yeah. because Cusco is located at the north end of the valley, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, but you've just also shattered another illusion because you've just reminded me then that there is no nice circumferential circle defining the system. That's again in the head of Tom, I take it. Right, right. No, there are some seques that have three wakas and are end up 
maybe three com kilometers from Cori Concha. There are other ones that might be 15 kilometers and have a dozen seques. So it's not a, a complete circle. I've read that there were wacka keepers, people who were specifically employed to maintain wackas and to perhaps make offerings at the right times so state worship was synchronized temporally. But would you imagine as well that there's, so there's lots of landslides, lots of floods, lots of diseases, lots of people getting attacked by El Tigre. Do you think that there was a constant channel of Inca runners running the lines, bringing back information, kipus with data about harvests? Do you think they functioned alive with the runners or not? I think you're thinking too big. Okay. They're all contained within the Cusco area, all within the, the horizon. Most you could walk in a couple hours. Okay, really, that puts it in context. Now, so this is something you could do on a day or a week. Every seque, you could go out and visit and come back in the same day. There are one or two exceptions that are, are, are long, but most are just within the, the Seque Valley. The, the point with Tom Zydema, yeah. Tom Zydema's model is it's completely hypothetical. And then there's a series of studies that build out from it. And so it's studies built on a hypothetical model that that become very pseudoscientific as they plot the the horizon and so what my project was is we don't have to start with the hypothetical we can go out and find these things and then build up one thing which is interesting not proven but i would guess as i said that these shrines an important part of the Seke system may have been land tenure. Oh, yeah. And so you could imagine over a century or two, the power of different groups ebbing and flowing, and they might take over lands of other king groups. And so you might have different wakas emerging on the landscape if they're to mark uh, land tenure, because land tenure is not necessarily a, a steady thing. Yeah. You mentioned Waka specialists. In fact, the Incas had a specific name. They're Waka Kamayoks. Kamayok means specialist. So you have a Kipu Kamayok. You have a Waka Kamayok. Uh, one is a specialist in Kipu. One is a specialist in in shrines, in wakas, and then you can add that uh, a, a kamayo, a, a woodworker, a, a kero kamayo. And so there's, there is lots of information that says there were specific people, and this would be depending on the importance of the shrine of the wakas. There were shrines of imperial importance, the Cori Cancha, yep. Pachacamac on the coast, the islands of the sun and the moon. Not only did they have Waka Kamayuks, they had land associated, herds associated, lots and lots of attendants. And then you might have smaller shrines. So it's on a spectrum. You might have smaller shrines that have three or four people involved in maintaining that shrine and further down you might just have one or walk as special places each farmer will have a special place that he offers he or she offers for good harvests so you have to think about sh shrines on this huge continuum that goes from local family shrines to imperial shrines that are pilgrimage places for the empire yeah it's fantastic you're you're describing broadway where you have coracanche is the central and largest theater but then all the side streets have their 
smaller localized theaters showing specific nuanced productions. Isn't it like that? Yeah, down to some some house who's putting on their own show. So you go from the small and local to the to the large. Yeah. In contemporary Moisca Colombia, they were using yopo, borrachero, and ayahuasca at these ceremonies. Have you ever considered what the seki system that might have been perceived while on the psychotropic substances or not? I haven't connected the seki system with any kind of drug use, but I think we can assume that much of religion, especially shamanistic religion, sure. is deeply related to the shaman's journey. And the shaman takes that journey through chanting, through deprivation, through drug. That's what shamans do. They take that journey. So I'm sure, and we know within the Inca and Tiwanaku, there are different drugs involved. Yeah. How they're attached to the ceremonies of specific shrines, I don't know, mm -hmm. especially the state shrines. Uh, I, I can't link drug use with shrines, but we can link drug use with religious activities without, without any problem. You brought it up, the shamanic journey, Brian. From here to Chile, the shamanic journey involves the shaman traveling on the Axis Mundi, his own zenith, no matter where that is, and they can traverse the three levels of Andean creation. Now, in Colombia here, at different times of the year, in conjunction with each other, certain wakas were transcended by shaman who then come together and hold a council meeting regarding the information they brought back. And Tom kind of never said it, but he alluded to the existence of a high priesthood who would be perhaps controlling data and information and shamanic knowledge. Do you think that's all pop cultural rubbish? Or do you think shamans did work with individual whackers and take perceived knowledge back to the center, back to the rulers or not? Sure. I don't see it as anything systematized. Uh, our habit as Westerners is, is to try to build larger, to recognize larger and more complex systems. Yeah. Uh, and there's kind of like standard, standard or standardization and, and a whole system of systemization of knowledge. And I don't, see that as especially applicable. Yeah. On the other hand, I can imagine very well if you visited an Inca mummy or if you visited a Waka, and we have very good information of one of the Pizarros visiting Pachacamac, and he said people would go in and talk with the Waka. And so I could imagine somebody serving as an oracle yeah, and that they would put themselves perhaps in a trance in order to speak for the waka. That would be kind of the shamanistic journey. And then they would report things to the person. So I could see drug use being used within that kind of setting, an oracle setting, but I don't see that information then being passed down down the line. Although we do have good documentation, for example, at times of critical decision making, the Incas would call upon the Waka Kamayoks to provide information about the future. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I asked you. <laughs> yeah, no, there's it's it's true we have good documentation for example um atahualpa is given advice about the spaniards that ends up to be bad and he goes to various shrines 
or sends people to various shrines to get information from them. Wow. And he doesn't like the the advice. So one shrine he goes in and he completely, completely destroys it. So I think that the Incas did s- seek advice from different shamans. And at times they might have spoken to one waka. There you go. Or at times they might have consulted various shrines, various wakas yeah. uh, to provide them information. So in that way, I could see the, the Inca because there are various cases where they're say the Inca asked oracles to, to provide advice to him. Yeah, which sounds so abstract. But Brian... It's nothing more or less than the person going to the church on a Sunday and sitting for an hour praying, asking for answers from the divine, isn't it? Absolutely. Nothing more abstract or mystical or magical than that. You're making decisions. You're hoping that the supernatural will be able to give you a hint into the future. And you can do that by reading the intestines of animals or having somebody go on a journey, but you're trying to get information about the future from people. So you're talking about shamans perhaps being asked to access cosmological realms to bring back information that might aid the state. Um, Here in Colombia, I've seen this in practice, whereby I was in a Moisca temple two years ago, and several of the, the leaders from surrounding territories came to Sesquile. There was no panic, no drama. but And they weren't all doing yopo. Some of them had done it the night before, but this is what they were talking about. A lot of the plants had developed a blue fungus, a, a mold that hadn't been seen for years. And n- because nobody present had direct experience of the fungus, they went to grandparents and backwards, but also went to the cosmological realms through meditation and yopo use to get insights and ideas to stimulate thoughts so the four of them together could make an accurate decision on what the hell did we do with this? Do we buy vats of cheap vinegar and water it down and spray our fields? Do we let the fields go rotten and burn them? And can you? what I'm indicating here is that while it's quite mystical to suggest a, a shaman was questing esoteric knowledge, it would have been for very practical purposes, Brian, wouldn't it? In a lot of cases, I think that is a a great a great example that you want you are faced with a problem and you need solutions, and those solutions may be known in the supernatural world, or at least they can point you to them. And you can ask one person, uh, probably better if you can ask three or four. You wrote in a book about the Seki lines. It's all about extension from a center. Mm. So not so much about the linearity of the extensions, but it's really about the center. We are bound by a center, way more so than any given Seki line or alignment. That was my point when we talked about Kori Kancha, or the Sekes, Sahama, Nazca. Mm. It's all about movement from the center. And of course, with that movement, you define the center because that's where it all starts. That's where it, it all ends. One thing I'd also like to note is that horizon astronomy is not hard. Any farmer will be able to tell you where the sun is and where it sets. And so it's it's a very, very simple thing. Yeah. And there are ceremonies, for example, for the Incas that marked like the first day of planting. Yeah. But any farmer doesn't need horizon astronomy to tell them that day. They'll look at the soil, they'll look at the rain, they'll, they have a million other indicators. So therefore, Brian, don't you think that what's happened is, I always put this down to a, 
an academic pretentiousness, and this is what I mean. Back in the 80s, if you said this system, wherever it might be, this system of alignments is calendrical, academics went, good research, we're good here. And if you said it was ritual or spiritual, you got shot down. Now, if you say it's calendrical, you've got a lot of work to do to prove that because we all think it's purely ritual and ceremonial. You don't need temples and the Cora Cancha to tell you when to plant a seed. Or what? What do you think? Right. But you use these things to mark... Significant moments. Exactly. You use them to, to demonstrate the state power. It's a time to hold huge rituals, and that ritual makes concrete the connection between the king and the supernaturals. Uh, I like to say that you know, religion is very abstract, right? We don't see these supernatural powers. They're not here. They're not in our time space. But if you hold a ritual, suddenly the religion becomes concrete. It becomes visible to everyone, mm -hmm. and thus it becomes undeniable. Yeah, there you go, It Brian. becomes clear. Who could deny the power of the Inca if he is in the center of Cusco? There's a huge ceremony with singing and a great spectacle, and you're watching the sun stop on the solstice on the horizon that link is made concrete and undeniable and that's why states use astronomy as large-scale public ritual and they don't use light casting or shadow casting because that can only be seen by a small number of people. Yes. Light casting and shadow casting is great for exact time. You can divide the day by light casting or shadow casting. You know, every sun clock that, that, that you've seen, you, you can go down to minutes. So you can divide a day into minutes, small, minute time periods, but that can only be visible by a small number of people. Yes. You can't go to the Washington Monument in Washington, D.C., gigantic tower, 555 feet tall. It's a huge gnomon. That's going to make a lousy clock yeah. because the shadow it casts is very gray on the edges. And fuzzy. It's fuzzy. History fuzz. But if you... <laughs> But if you put a pencil up, that pencil is going to cast a very fine shadow. So light casting and shadow casting is great for exact moments, but it's lousy. It's lousy for public spectacle. So you use horizon astronomy for the big festivals. Right. Superb. So let's go here. While a ruler an arena of people watching these key moments on the festivals are watching the sun either rising or setting on the horizon. That's where the connection between sky and land is made. But surely astronomers caring about calendars would have been more concerned with either the sun or the moon or the star passing or culminating on that meridian, wouldn't they? A fixed meridian is much more effective than a horizon that maybe trees can grow on or a landslide can happen. Or What do you mean a, a meridian? What I mean by that is as early as 3000 BC in Neolithic Scotland, you will find stones forming as north to south alignment, which would allow astronomers to observe the moon or the sun crossing a fixed meridian, unchangeable in the sky, aligned with the north celestial pole or the crux in the south. Mm. And I always think that at those times of ritual, what happens on the horizons is everything, but somewhere in the inner core of the Inca kingdom must have been some astronomers who were very concerned with maintaining 
a meridian. And I haven't looked to see what lies to the north in Cusco if there is a meridian marked. Have you seen any signs of a formal meridian having functioned in Cusco or perhaps even down on the island of the sun? No, I haven't. But we have not looked for it either. Yeah. Would that be like a wall? Would a straight wall be used? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. So the earliest cultures in Norway built cone facing the north and it framed the circumpolar stars. Mm. And these are a kilometre long lines of stones. It's the bisection in the middle marks the meridian. Mm -hmm. I looked at the archaeoastronomy of um, Tiwanaku and, and I don't think this is in any ways a coincidence that the north to south wall of the Kalasasaya is within a 15 metre variance off the top of Kimsachata mountain, the highest in the environment. That wall was oriented as a north to south meridian with Kimsachata in the south perfectly. And that's an example of a wall. How does that differ from being aligned with the uh, equinox? In many, many ancient cultures, when they were founding or measuring the ancient landscape or building, they founded the east to west equinox line first. Right. And then the meridian was drawn from that. Okay. With a stick in a field, you can use the shadow in a day to form your east to west. At night time, the meridian can be drawn to the celestial pole in the north or to the midday sun in the south. Got it. Because uh, there are lots of data. I mean, there's no doubt that... Uh, the equinox was marked. You have Garcilaso de la Vega's great description of the equinox mm. near near Ecuador. Sure. Uh, and we presume, actually, he has a very nice description of the equinox. This is Garcilaso de, de la Vega. He's very literate Spaniard as, as well. His mother was um, an Inca princess. His father was... Uh, an officer of the Spaniards, and he writes about astronomy, and he talks about the the equinox, and of course the equinox can be marked on the equator with a gnomon not casting a shadow at midday. But he brings out the very interesting fact that that's not the case in Cusco. Many people think any place on the equinox you would have a, a shadow, you would not have a shadow on the days of the equinox. That, that's not true. Uh, once you move away from the equator, what happens is that the shadow casts a straight line mm. on the equinox. And he mentions that, that in Cusco, the line along which the shadow forms or something like that. And that's a pretty detailed description. I don't know how many Spaniards would know that. It's hard to know the level of kind of astronomical. It's got to have been important in the cosmology of the Incas in some way, I would imagine, that this axis, because in all of the camera temples where the north to south alignment within a temple meets the up and down, if you like, that is where the axis mundi is formed. Mm. So that there must have been in some ways relevant in the cosmology. But um, well, I have one last question for you. You brought it up. You brought up the day of no shadows, it's called here. We're five degrees north of the equator. So that means seven days after the equinox, we get our zenith day, where at midday, you could be holding your spade in the garden and you get a fright. And then you realize it's that moment and you, you get that fright for a few days leading up to it and a few days after. Sure. What evidence is there of the zenith being worshipped in, in Inca culture? I think the best reference to that is Garcilaso talking about the, the, the equinox. Um, Zydema then goes on a great binge and he makes up this thing which he calls the the anti zenith. Oh, the anti zenith. Your your colleague Charles Stanich said that 
he was that way inclined to say this is just a bit of ridiculousness. I actually heard it again recently. Yeah, it, nobody does this, but it, it it's this starting with a hypothetical model and then trying to nail down that hypothetical model with observations that people it's trying to bring science kind of to the model but it doesn't make make sense he's presented a hypothetical start so then, and then he's been teased into presenting a hypothetical end if you like to say right. so right so right is my first part that they even did this right and, and by showing that you prove the non hypotheticalness of your of your first model yeah, I think we should leave this, Brian, at both uh, accepting that Tom had an, an amazing career where he was he was tempted to ask big questions that most professors wouldn't ask. And I think perhaps through being brave enough to ask these questions, he produced a lot of really interesting observations, but maybe less so the conclusions that he drew. I think he was a bit off with the conclusions, but he did kind of re-spark an interest in this entire system within Cusco, the CK system. Or are you going to take that away from him? Perhaps you were before him, Brian, were you? No, no. Tom wrote, uh, he wrote his, I believe it's his doctoral dissertation on the CK system, and I think it's 1954, something like that. Uh, Tom was a, a great guy always lovely to talk to a, a, a true gentleman in, in in every way but he was also a structuralist that's what charles said so he was looking at repetitive yeah he he's looking for kind of repetitive thought structures within a, a society and, and you would find the same relationships expressed in different ways throughout the culture. Sure. And so he sought explanation by trying to find that underlying structure. And he did not work as a scientist who kind of went to gather, make a hypothesis and test that data with or, or he would make a hypothesis and test that through the data he collected. He That just wasn't his form of, of investigation. Yeah. Brian, I want to thank you specifically for something, and it's this. In my 20s, I was deluded by lots of the research that happened on the Seki lines, and I'll confess this now, but it was by reading your works like 15 and 20 years ago that kind of it gave me a, a new age holistic clean. You, you buffed up all my frilly edges and you sharpened me up because until your work came out about the actual alignment that is there with the pillars, there was so much speculation. But I think what you did was lay out and say, okay, this is what the Incas did and this is as close to woo as they got. Then so much became apparent of what they didn't do. And you kind of set lines on the actual study of Inca archaeoastronomy that hadn't been done before it. And I think what you've done is set a foundation on which a far greater understanding of astronomy in the Inca world's been built. And I dare say, if you hadn't done with what you did with Charles and Professor Dearborn, we would still be in a world where the works of Tom would be hailed as. The, the, the authority on Cusco. So I thank you for that. I thank you for really changing the outcome of my own interests in this field, Brian. So thanks for doing that in a really concise way today. Well, thank you very much. I, I think that one can, one can propose models, mm -hmm. but you don't end there. What you want to do is propose that model and then somehow test it. Uh, and we will all present models that in the end don't work and we may have to abandon them but it's the it's that ground verification that data collection uh which i think is is important you're drawing conclusions from data rather than looking for data to support your pre-drawn conclusions exactly exactly thank you brian thank you very much 
If you enjoyed this episode, hit subscribe, drop a five star review or share it with a friend. And you can get in touch with me through HistoryFuzz.com.